Shall we turn now to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2? As, as we shared with you last week, Paul had been called of God to come over to Macedonia. <laughs> when he arrived in Macedonia, he began, first of all, in Philippi. There he was thrown into prison, into the dungeon, into the stocks. And... Uh, God used that for his glory. But then he was requested by the men of the city to leave town. So he came to Thessalonica after this uh, bad experience in Philippi. And also in Thessalonica, they stirred up problems and trouble against Paul, going to the city magistrates not finding Paul, they grabbed one of the converts there, Justice, and uh, took him before the city magistrates, and he had to post bail, and uh, Paul was uh, encouraged to leave town. He went down to Berea, and there again problems, so uh, he left Timothy and uh, Silas to uh, go back to Thessalonica, sort of encourage them as Paul went on to Athens, and uh, then later on down to Corinth. Uh, the <laughs> reception that he got in Macedonia, I'm sure would have caused many of us to question whether or not it was really the leading of the Spirit to go to Macedonia. Uh, after uh, he gets there, you know, the Spirit said uh, for him to go, uh, he saw in a vision a man from Macedonia saying, come over and help us. And so he came on over. But uh, immediately the ministry ran into great difficulties. And uh, a lesser uh, person than Paul would have concluded that uh, it was somehow a mistake that he went there and would have headed off someplace else. So at the beginning of chapter 2, he talks a little bit about his first coming to Thessalonica. Now he is writing in about the year 54. Uh, it's the earliest epistle of Paul. Uh, this is his first letter, and he wrote it when he had arrived in Corinth. Uh, and uh, Timothy and Silas joined him there, and so he sent this letter back to the church in Thessalonica with Timothy in order that Timothy might minister to them and strengthen them. So he said, Yourselves, brethren, know that our entrance into you, that it was not in vain. In other words, God did accomplish his purposes there. Many of you came to a faith in Jesus Christ. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, said that your labor for the Lord is never in vain. The glorious thing about serving God is that it is a salaried position, not commission. We're not really paid uh, uh, with the re for the results. We're paid for our faithfulness in fulfilling the call of God on our hearts. The obedience to Jesus as our master, and, and we're salaried rather than commissioned and, and that's, that's comforting, because a lot of times we, we don't see any visible fruit of our ministry. I have a friend who labored among the uh, Serenoi Indians in Bolivia. He was there seven years before he had his first convert. And uh, then, of course, once the Lord began to break through into their hearts, there were many, many, the whole tribe almost that accepted the Lord, but uh, seven years without a convert. So your labor for the Lord is never in vain. Paul said our coming there was not in vain. 
But even after we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi. Uh, and as we mentioned there in Philippi, he was arrested, he was beaten, uh, many stripes laid on him. Then he was placed uh, in the stocks in the inner prison, shamefully uh, entreated. And uh, yet we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Uh, we do read in Acts that as Paul shared the gospel, there were uh, those that received immediately, and then the other side of the coin was there were those that rose up against Paul and began to say blasphemous things against the things that Paul was teaching. So there was a lot of contention there in Thessalonica at the ministry of Paul. But he said, our exhortation. And, and now Paul is going to talk about his ministry. And as Paul talks about his ministry, surely this is a classic model for anyone who is interested in being involved in the ministry. Whatever ministry for the Lord, he is setting a classic example. And later Paul said, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Jesus Christ. So our exhortation, he says, first of all, was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness. And that Greek word, uh, akatharsis, is a word that usually is referring to moral impurity, nor in guile or deceitfulness. Paul was straightforward. He exhorted them in a straightforward manner. He wasn't using deception. It wasn't deceitful. Nor was it of moral impurity, nor in guile. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, and I like that, God entrusted us to share his good news. We were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, this good news that we have. God has entrusted it to us. Even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which tries our hearts. So I was there. I wasn't saying things to gain popularity. I didn't speak in order to please men. Paul wrote in another gospel, for if we please all men, we are not the servants of Christ. The truth oftentimes is not well received. Many times people don't want to hear the truth. They would rather be flattered. They would rather have the feel-good kind of sermons where you go out with sort of a chuckle and I feel like, you know, I can now conquer the world because I've learned the seven steps of prosperity. And, and the, the, so often sermons are designed to please men. But not so with Paul. He was a straight shooter. He would tell the truth. And the truth would oftentimes upset people. But he wasn't seeking to please man. He was seeking to please God. And that should be at the heart of every servant of God to realize that I'm not here as a man pleaser. I'm here to please God. For one day I must answer not to man for my ministry, but I must answer to God for my ministry. And I think that it's important that a minister have that acknowledgement, that recognition that one day I am responsible to God and I will answer to God for the ministry that he has entrusted to me. 
And so Paul said, he's entrusted to me the gospel. And I didn't use the, uh, I didn't seek to please men, but God who tries the hearts. He knows my heart and the motive, the real motive for the ministry. For neither, he said, at any time used we flattering words. As you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. And here he calls God it is, as his witness. First of all, I didn't use flattering words, and you know that. You're my witness to that. But the covetousness, God is witness to that because God knows my heart. I wasn't there coveting from you. I wasn't there in order to raise a big offering, to raise support for the ministry. I wasn't there using gimmicks uh, to, uh, give you, to get you to give and to give generously to the support of the ministry. Not so. There was no cloak of covetousness. God is my witness to that. Nor did I seek the glory of man and this again is a vital thing for the minister, not to seek the glory of man, not to seek the praise of the people. So we did not seek the glory neither of you nor of others when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. As apostles, we could have come and demanded your support because the Bible declares that you're not to muzzle the ox that treads out the corn, that the laborer is worthy of his hire. And Paul said, however, we didn't become burdensome to you. We weren't a burden on you. though we could have been as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth us her children. So we ministered in a very gentle way, in a loving way, compassionate way. Uh, we weren't harsh, but we were very uh, loving, concerned, as a nurse is concerned for the children that she is caring for, so we were as a nurse caring for you in tenderness, in loving. So being affectionately desirous of you, because we so much desired to see you walking with Jesus, we were willing to have imparted to you not the gospel of God only, but our own souls, because you were dear to us. And hear the heart now of the apostle. You know, it isn't just the gospel that I wanted to impart to you, but my own soul, because you're so dear to us. He had developed a tremendous uh, love and affection for those in Thessalonica. You know, as we look back on the many years of ministry and actually um, next month will mark 50 years of ministry for me. And as we look back, <laughs> what does I say, next month? This month. <laughs> get old and you get senile, you know, but... Um, as I look back on the various churches that we pastored, we look back with keen fondness on, on, on the people that we were privileged to minister to. Kay and I oftentimes reflect on the various churches that we pastored and the people in those churches as we 
uh, remember some of the incidents and, uh, and, and the people themselves and how they became so dear to us. I understand what Paul is saying uh, to the Thessalonians as he speaks about his affection and, and his desires for them and willing to impart his very soul because they were so dear to him. For you remember, brethren, our labor and our travail. For laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. So Paul and Silas and Timothy probably worked during the day. And then they held night Bible studies. Uh, but they were laboring among them and travailing night and day uh, in order that they might bring them the gospel without charge. Uh, they didn't want anyone to accuse them of, of being sort of mercenaries or being in it for the money. They were willing, if necessary, to support themselves in order to be in the ministry. For the first 17 years of our ministry, the churches we pastored were so small that we had to work laboring with our hands in order to support the family so we could stay in the ministry. I know exactly what Paul is talking about. But the joy of being able to minister to people is so great. You don't mind working if necessary in order to be able to share the gospel of God with people. And so laboring night and day, you are witnesses. And you remember our labor and travail because we didn't want to be chargeable. I love the outreaches that we have here at Calvary Chapel where when we are seeking to reach out to the community, such as we will be in the Good Friday service, Good Friday uh, evening also, the, the Good Friday noontime service, the evening service, the Easter sunrise service, we don't take offerings. And I, I like that. Not chargeable to anybody. We just present it to the people. And, and I, I, I really love to be able, when we are in an evangelistic kind of outreach, to never take an offering. Because so many people, you know, say, oh, well, all they want is the money. And, and you can really just destroy that kind of an argument when you don't ask for money, you don't take pledges, you do nothing, uh, you know, and now don't even pass the plate and there's no box to drop it in when you leave. You know, it's just offering it to the people without charge. And, and that's a great way to be. And Paul was rejoicing in that when he was in Thessalonica, he was able to work with his own hands, laboring among them day and night in order that he wouldn't be chargeable unto them. For you are witnesses and God also. Now, earlier, God was his witness, and now he again calls God as his witness, and they also. How holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believed. We were there in holiness, in purity. We were there in justice. And we were there unblameable. We lived an exemplary life before you. You're witnesses of that. It was in holiness, unblameable. And you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you. The three things. Exhortation, how we exhorted you, and how we comforted you. The comfort of the scriptures. Paul 
says, He that prophesieth speaketh to the church for edification and for exhortation and for comfort. So you know that we were there, how we exhorted, how we comforted, and then how we charged every one of you, challenged you, so to speak. As a father does his children, we were, you know, this relationship, this beautiful relationship, our concern as a father with his child that you walk in the right path, that you live the right life. And so he exhorted them what? That they would walk worthy of God. You're a child of God now. You've been born again by the Spirit of God. You've become a part of the family of God as a son of God. Now God is holy and God is pure. And because you are a child of God, you must be holy, you must be pure, you must walk in honesty, in purity, in holiness. And Paul was exhorting them to these things, charging them as a father his, his children, how they ought to walk now that they have embraced Jesus Christ in Christianity. Thessalonica was in the midst of a pagan society. Every kind of vice was practiced. We would classify them as extremely impure, immoral, governed by their fleshly desires, sexually promiscuous, no sense of honesty or decency, and Paul comes to people living in this pagan environment. And he says, God loves you and wants to forgive you your sins. The gospel of God is the gospel of forgiveness of man's sins through Jesus Christ. But now that you've received Jesus, now you've become a child of God and thus your whole lifestyle needs to change. No longer can you be dishonest. No longer can you be cruel and mean. You must be kind. You must be forgiving. You must be honest. You must walk in love. And you must live a life of purity. And so Paul is a father, and you can hear him as he talks to them and shares with them the way they need to live as a child of God, that they would walk worthy of God, who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. You are now a citizen of the heavenly kingdom. The rules are different in the heavenly kingdom than they are in the worldly kingdom. And as a citizen now of the heavenly kingdom, it's a kingdom of glory, and you need now to walk as a citizen of God's kingdom. For this cause, Paul said, also thank we God without ceasing, because you received the word which you heard of us. So, there was a great reception to the teaching of Paul, to this gospel of God that Paul shared. The people received it. And, and that word received, the gospel, is equivalent to they believed it, they accepted it, they were born again. So Paul is thanking God without ceasing as he mentions how he prays without ceasing, thinking of the Thessalonians, he was thanking God how they received the word of God. And you received it, he said, not as the word of man, not my word, not my interpretation of it, but you received it as it is in truth, the word of God. You recognize that this was God's word. And you received it as such. Now, in Acts chapter 17, it tells us about 
Paul's ministry in Thessalonica. It's just a short paragraph because he really wasn't there very long before trouble uh, was stirred up by the Jews. And so uh, he had to leave Thessalonica uh, under, you know, by stealth uh, because they were looking for him to arrest him and so they, his friends got him out of the city. But we read in Acts 17 that Paul was alleging from the scriptures how that the Messiah must suffer and die and rise again, and that Jesus was the Messiah. The word of the crucifixion of Jesus had spread through the world. And so Paul comes now declaring to them that Jesus was the Messiah even though he suffered and died. And he began to point out the scriptures, Isaiah 53, 52, uh, Psalm 22, and, and the many passages of scripture, Daniel chapter 9, where it talked about the Messiah being cut off, where the Messiah would be despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief and wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. And, and sharing with them these verses, showing, alleging, and showing from the Scriptures that the Scriptures actually prophesied that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise again. And thus, Jesus was the Messiah. And they received this. They looked at the scriptures. They were convinced. God's word prophesied the suffering of the Messiah, and they accepted Jesus as the Messiah. And so they received it as the word of God, as it is in truth. And it effectually works also in you that believe. The glorious thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ is that it works. It transforms a person's life. Today, in the end of the 20th century, the power of the gospel has not changed. It is still effectual. It can still bring changes in people's lives. It can bring them from darkness to light. It can deliver them from the power of Satan and bring them into the kingdom of God. The glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, the word of God, works in hearts and lives. It works. That's the thing. It is effectual in bringing to pass changes. Brings you from sorrow into joy, from unrest into peace the glorious working of the Word of God in our hearts and lives today. But it was effectual in Thessalonica 2,000 years ago almost. And it is effectual wherever it is preached, in whatever society, whatever culture, wherever the gospel goes, it transforms and changes lives. The power of the Word of God working in our hearts and lives transforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. So this word, Paul said, you received it, which effectually works also in you that believe. For you, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which are in Judea and are in Christ Jesus. For you also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. So you've become a part of the family, the church. Now, the church in, began in Jerusalem, in Judea there. And the church in Judea suffered much from the non-believing Jews who looked upon the church as a sect that had to be destroyed. And so the church experienced tremendous persecution from the Jews, their own countrymen. But you in Thessalonica, just like them in Judea, 
have experienced a lot of persecution from your own countrymen. It is interesting how that people seem to resent those who want to live a holy, pure life. You don't want to drink. You don't want to carouse. You don't want to cheat on your wife. You don't want to go to Vegas and gamble away your money and go to the night shows and so forth. And, and they don't like you. In fact, they develop a hatred of you. They begin to persecute you. They begin to talk against you. They begin to give you titles like Holy Joe. And, and they begin to make fun of you. Why would they resent your wanting to live a pure life? Why would they resent your wanting to be honest in all of your dealings? Many of the people in the church have lost their jobs because their bosses required that they lie or they cheat in the accounting processes. And because they were Christians, they felt they couldn't do it, and it cost them their jobs. Why would people really want to have a dishonest employee? If your employee will be dishonest in the keeping of your books, then you can be sure he's going to thieve from you when he gets a chance because he is dishonest. It's, it's an interesting thing. You want them to be honest towards you, but dishonest towards others. There are those that have lost their jobs because they wouldn't lie about the product that they were selling. They, they wanted them to deceive people about what the product was able to do. Tragic, isn't it, that the world doesn't dis, just dislike, they hate the person who seeks to walk in purity and in holiness and in righteousness. When I went to Santa Ana High School years ago, we had a fellow in school, Bill Yarwood. His father was the postmaster in Santa Ana at the time. Not Bill Yarwood. But at any rate, uh, he had made a stand that he wouldn't listen to dirty jokes. And so around high school, the guys would say, oh, that's DJ, Dirty Joke Harwood, you know. He won't listen to dirty jokes. And they made fun of him. Now, why would people make fun of a person who wants to keep his mind pure? There is an antagonism of the world against purity, against righteousness, against holiness. And so the church has always, if it is preaching the truth of God and lives are being transformed, it always generates persecution from the world. They that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's one of those promises I really don't like. Speaking of the Jews, who had, of course, set themselves against Paul and were really persecuting Paul, they were the ones who instituted his stoning in Lystra. They were the ones who instituted his being beaten and imprisoned in Philippi. They were the ones who stirred up 
the people against Paul in Thessalonica that forced him to have to leave town. They followed him down to Berea and created such a stir he had to leave Berea. They were fighting him wherever he was going with the gospel. And so Paul writes concerning those Jews. He said they both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. Now you remember when Stephen was speaking to the council, he asked the question, which of the prophets did not your fathers kill? But you're worse than they are because you killed the one that they were prophesying about, the Messiah. And that's when they got so angry, they gnashed on him with their teeth, they began to yell, and they drug him out of the gate of the city, and they stoned him to death. As Paul stood by, consenting and holding the coats of those who stoned him. But now Paul, having received Jesus Christ, is now the object of their hatred and their venom. And so speaking of the Jews, they killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And they please not God, but they are contrary to all men. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles. And the big thing with the Jews was their, their anger against Paul was the fact that he was bringing the gospel to the Gentiles and telling the Gentiles that they could be saved. That God would forgive and pardon them their sins. That made the Jews angry because they felt that salvation was only for Jews. And you could not be saved unless you were a Jew. God's salvation was offered only to the Jew, to no one else. And you remember when Paul came back to Jerusalem with an offering for the church. And as he was going through the purification rites so that he could attempt, attend the temple services at the holiday, some of the Jews spied him in the temple grounds. And they began to say, this is the man who is, you know, preaching to the Gentiles throughout all of Asia. And they pounced on him and started to beat him to death. And the Roman guard and the Antonio Fortress saw the tumult down there on the Temple Mount. They came rushing down and they rescued Paul from the mob who were attempting to beat him to death. And there on the temple porch, Paul said to the captain, can I speak to him? He said, sure. And as Paul began to speak to them in Hebrew, telling of his conversion, saying, I understand you, I understand your zeal, I understand why you're angry with me, I understand why you want to kill me. Because I was just like you. I felt the same way you feel. But I had an experience. The high priest will testify. He gave me papers and authority to go to Damascus to imprison those that called on the name of Jesus. But while I was on the way, the Lord met me. And he said, I am calling you to go to the Gentiles. The moment he said that, it was like lighting a match to gasoline. The whole place blew up. They began to throw dirt in the air. They began to scream. They began to tear their clothes. They, they said, kill him, kill him. And they began to rush towards the Antonio Fortress. And so they pulled Paul within, closed the gate. But they were angry, as Paul declares here, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. They didn't want the message of salvation to be brought to the Gentiles. Paul said, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. God's judgment is going to fall, and did fall. Uh, within 18 years after Paul, actually 16 years, after Paul wrote this letter to the Thessalonians, Titus came and besieged Jerusalem and slaughtered over a million people in taking the city of Jerusalem. 
one of the worst slaughters in the history of man. And if you read the Antiquities and Wars of the Jews by Josephus, uh, you will read, as Paul said, uh, the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. It was certainly that. And that was just within 16 years after Paul had written to the Thessalonians. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, but not in heart. We had to leave, but hey, my heart's still with you. I'm still there with you in my heart. Endeavored more abundantly to see your face with great desire. How I wanted to come back. I wanted to see your faces again. My heart is there, and oh, how I long to be there among you. And we would have come to you once and again. A couple of times we tried to come, but Satan hindered us. Now, how Satan hindered, Paul doesn't say. It's interesting that... <clears throat> When Paul was wanting to go to Asia, the Holy Spirit forbid him. Now Satan is hindering him from coming back to Thessalonica to personally minister to them again. How, we don't know. For he said, what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? Isn't that our desire? Isn't that our joy? That's what we're longing for. Our hope, the crown of rejoicing, is that when Jesus comes, you'll be there. You'll be with him at his coming. As, as we mentioned Throughout 1 Thessalonians, the coming of Jesus is, is a prominent theme throughout the book. Paul was only there for a short time, but he shared with them the glorious kingdom of God that is going to come. He shared with them how that Jesus died, rose again, ascended into heaven, but how that Jesus is coming back again. And so over and over in this epistle, he is referring again to the return of the Lord. And what is our joy and our crown and our hope? It's being with you when the Lord returns. I like to come now. Satan has hindered us, but oh, I look forward to and, and wait for the Lord to come where we will be together again. For you are our glory and our joy. And, and so the ministry, the work of God and seeing the work of God in the lives of people is the joy and the reward of the ministry. John wrote in his third epistle, I have no greater joy than to know that my children Walk in truth. To see people going on serving the Lord. Growing in the things of the Lord. What a joy that is to the heart of the minister. And so what a joy to see you tonight. What a joy to spend this time with you. What a joy to be able to share with you the word of God and to grow together in the things of God. What a glory, what a joy. Father, we thank you for the privilege of sharing the gospel. We thank you for your word and its power to transform lives. And Lord, we thank you that you've called us to be your children, and to walk worthy of God. Help us, Lord. Strengthen us by your Holy Spirit. For our desire, Lord, is to indeed be holy, even as you are holy. 
righteous even as you are righteous, pure even as you are pure, loving even as you are loving, forgiving as you are forgiving. Lord, we want to be like you. Mold us into your image. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we stand. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only always living in me. Amen. God bless you. God bless you.